Chapter 21, Shortened Distance, A Drift in Sandstorms, Part 2 Xie Lian didn't know whether to laugh or cry, and was about to command Roye to grab onto something else when the weight on his arm suddenly became lighter. Xie Lian's heart sank. This wasn't the feeling of Roye being released, but something much worse. Surely enough, the red silhouette suddenly grew closer and was soon within reach. Sanlong had been dragged into the windstorm too. Xie Lin shouted, Don't panic! to him, but the moment he opened his mouth, he got another mouthful of sand. At this point, Xie Lin had gotten used to eating sand. He was trying to tell Sanlong not to panic, but in all honesty, he didn't think the boy would panic in the slightest. Roye continued to withdraw back to Xie Lin, closing the distance between him and the boy who had just been blown into the sky. As he suspected, Sanlong didn't look the least bit anxious, appearing as if he could calmly open up a book and read right then and there. Xie Lin wondered if Sanlong had gotten dragged in on purpose. Roye wrapped itself around the waists of the two to rope them together. Xie Lin then commanded, Go, try again, but don't bring up any more people. The silk band shot out once again, but this time it grabbed on to... Nanfeng and Fu Yao? Xie Lin felt drained. Roye, he said tiredly. I said no people, but I didn't mean it so literally. All right. Xie Lin twisted himself towards the ground and shouted, Nanfeng! Fu Yao! Hang on! Hang on tight! Down below, of course Nanfeng and Fu Yao did their utmost to try and anchor themselves, but the winds were simply too strong, and soon, without any surprise, another two silhouettes joined them in the twister. Now all four of them, tied together by Roye, were swirling about in the twister, getting pulled higher and higher off the ground, winds and sand meshing and blowing about. How did you both get blown up here too? Xinan shouted, enduring all the sand going into his mouth. Ask your dumb Roye! Fu Yao yelled back, also getting mouthfuls of sand as he spat these words. Xinan seized his dumb Roye with both hands and said woefully, My dear Roye, all four of us are counting on you now. Please, don't grab the wrong thing again. Now go! Xinan miserably released Roye once more. Stop relying on that toy! Think of something else! Nanfeng roared. But just then, Xie Lin felt a tug from the other end of the silk band and lit up. Wait! Give it one more chance! It's caught something! It better not be a random passerby! Let the poor person go! Fu Yao roared too. Xie Lin was also afraid of the same thing. He tugged back at Roye, but it remained taut and firm, and Xie Lin let out a breath of relief. It's not! It's something solid! Quite stable! Then he commanded Roye, Pull! Against the crazed twister, Roye rapidly shortened and lugged the four out of and then away from the windstorm. Gradually, Xianlin could make out the contours of something large, black, and half round down below, the size of a small temple. When they finally touched ground, Xianlin saw that this round structure was actually a giant boulder. In the midst of the windstorm, this boulder was like a fortress, the perfect shelter. While on the road earlier, however, none of them had seen a rock like this. Who knew how far the twister had taken them? When they landed, they immediately circled around to the back of the boulder to hide from the wind. The moment they went around, understanding dawned on Xielian. He cheered, Thank the heaven officials' blessings! Turns out, behind the back of this boulder, there was a hole. The hole was as wide as two doors combined, but the length of half a person. Although a bit short, it was still possible to enter if one bent down. The hole's opening was jagged and slant, but appeared to be more haphazardly man-made rather than naturally formed. When Xie Lin entered, he discovered that the inside was actually hollowed out and quite deep. It was dark further inside, so he didn't bother trying to look around and settled down where there was light. He patted the sand off Roye and wrapped it back on his arm. Nanfeng and Fu Yao were both spitting out sand, covered in it from head to toe from their eyes, to their ears, to their mouths and noses, and all over their clothes. They peeled off their outer robes and shook them out, dumping small mounds of sand onto the ground in the process. Out of the four of them, only Senlong looked unruffled. He lazily dusted himself off and was proper again. Other than his lopsided ponytail, his carefree form remained unaffected. That ponytail had been tied by Xielian and was askew to begin with, so a little wind made no noticeable difference anyway. 
Nunfeng wiped his face and started cursing, while Selin dumped sand from his bamboo hat. <sighs> I didn't think you two would get pulled in as well. Why didn't you use the thousand pound weight spell? We did! It was useless! Nanfeng spat angrily. From the side, Fu Yao was still shaking sand out of his outer robe and said nastily, Where do you think we are? This is a desert in the northwest, not the main domain of my general. Nanfeng continued, The north is the territory of the two generals' pay, and the west belongs to Chen Yijin. You won't find a Nanyang temple within a hundred mile radius of this place. There is a saying that even a powerful dragon cannot win against the local overlord snakes. As Nenfeng and Fu Yao represented generals of the southeast and southwest, their powers were restricted outside of their own territories. That's really quite hard on you guys. Xie Lian watched their annoyed faces and felt sympathy for them, thinking this might have been their first time getting pulled into a twister and tumbled about. Sun Long sat down next to him. With a hand propping up his cheek, he asked, so, are we just gonna sit here until the storm blows over? Looks like that'll have to be the case, Selin turned to him and replied. As strong as that twister is, it can't possibly blow a giant rock into the sky. You never know. Like you said, there's something off about that wind. A sudden thought came to Selin. Selong, may I ask you a question? Go ahead, Selong replied. That guoshi of Banyue, is it a man or a woman? Xianin asked. Did I not mention earlier? They're a woman. Just as he suspected, Xianin thought. He said, Earlier, when we were resting at the abandoned inn, didn't we see two figures pass by? The one in white was a woman cultivator. Fu Yao looked doubtful. It's not easy to identify whether it was a man or woman by those robes, and that individual looked taller than your average woman. Are you sure you saw right? I'm absolutely sure. Xilin said. So I thought she might be the guoshi of Ban Yue. It's possible, Nanfeng said. But there was another black-clad figure traveling next to her. Who could that be? Hard to say, but that person was walking even faster than she was. Their strength is definitely not below hers, Xilin said. Could it have been the other evil guoshi, Fang Xin? Fu Yao wondered. I think in regard to that, the whole dual wicked masters title is given only because, historically, what they've done is similar, both equally evil. So people connected them together as a pair to remember them more easily, like the whole four famous tales or the four great calamities, even if there aren't four, they are made for because it's simpler. Hearing this, Sanlong burst out laughing. Xie Lin stared at him. <laughs> it's nothing, Sanlong said. I just thought what you said made sense. One of the four in the Four Great Calamities is certainly only there for the head count. Please continue. Xie Lin continued. In reality, the dual wicked masters don't have any relation to each other. I've heard of Master Feng Xin. He was the Guoshi of Yong An, born at least a hundred years earlier than Master Ban Yue. You don't know of the Four Great Calamities in the Ghost Realm, but you know about Master Feng Xin of Yong An in the Mortal Realm? Fu Yao asked in disbelief. I overhear these things while collecting junk in the mortal realm. It's not like I collect junk in the ghost realm, so of course I don't learn anything about them," Xianlin explained. The wind outside the hole seemed to be dying down. Nanfeng walked closer to the opening of their shelter, patting the rocky surfaces here and there, inspecting it. Why would there be a hollow rock like this in the middle of a desert? He thought the boulder to be rather suspicious, but Xianlin didn't think this to be so. They're not so rare. Back then, the people of Ban Yue would build shelters like this to hide from sandstorms, or even for passing nights while out grazing their livestock. Some holes weren't dug, but rather were blown out, Xianlin said. How could they graze in a desert? Nanfeng asked, confused. Xianlin smiled. It wasn't all desert here 200 years ago. There used to be an oasis. Go go! Sanlong called. What is it? Xianlin turned his head to reply. Sanlong raised his hand and pointed. The rock you're sitting on seems to have writing on it. What? Xianlin looked down, then stood up, and found that where he had previously sat was actually a stone slate. After wiping off the layer of dust, there were indeed letters on its surface. The characters were carved lightly in a vertical manner, with the slate half buried in the sand, the words were faint and shrouded in the darkness. If there were writings here, then they must be inspected. 
I don't have much power left. Can anyone lend me a palm light? Thanks, Xianin asked. Nanfeng snapped his fingers and a small burst of flame ignited in his palm. Xianin stole a glance at Senlong, but he didn't appear surprised. Xianin supposed that, after seeing the distance shortening array, there wasn't much more to be surprised about. Nanfeng moved his palm to where Xianin directed him to brighten the writing on the stone slate. The characters were odd, as if drawn by a toddler, slanting and wild. What the hell is this? Nanfeng wondered. Ban Yue script. Duh, Sanlong replied. I'm sure he meant the meaning of those words, Xianin said. Let me see. Xianin dusted off more dust and sand from the stone slate and revealed the first column of writing within the largest characters. They must make the heading. The same characters also appeared repeatedly in various sections of the text's body. Fu Yao approached and also produced a palm torch. You know how to read Ban Yue script? Truth be told, I collected junk in Ban Yue before that whatever wicked master of Ban Yue came about, Xianin replied. Is there something wrong? Nothing, Fu Yao hmphed. Just wondering where you haven't collected junk. Xianin flashed a smile, then looked down again at the characters. He suddenly said, General. What? Nanfeng and Fu Yao answered at the same time. Xianin looked up. The first word on this stone slate is general. He paused for a moment. But there's another character after that I'm unsure the meaning of. Nanfeng seemed to have sighed in relief. You just keep looking and think. Xianin nodded, and Nanfeng shifted his palm over further to light up the other words. Something didn't feel right, Xianin thought. There seemed to be something more at the peripheral of his vision. With both hands pressed on the rock, Xianin raised his head. Above the stone slate, the flickering flames illuminated a stiff human face. This face, with its bulged eyes, was looking down straight at him. Ah! The one who screamed wasn't Xianin or Nanfeng, but that stiff face. Nanfeng immediately took out his other hand and ignited it as well. He put both hands together and grew the flames until they were bright enough to light up the entire cave. The one whose face was revealed by the light was a person that had been hiding in the shadows all this time. When the flames grew bigger, he scurried alongside the walls toward the inner cave, and there, Xianin saw seven to eight people huddling in fear, trembling. Who are you? Nanfeng shouted. Nanfeng's angry cry echoed in the cave, and Xianin, whose ears were still ringing from the scream earlier, covered his ears. Noise from the windstorms had deafened their hearing, and ever since they entered the cave, they had been discussing the wicked master of Ban Yue, and then the writing on the stone slate. No one had noticed there were others also hiding within the same shelter. The seven to eight people shivered for a while before an elder of fifty or so years stammered. We're a merchant caravan passing through the area, just normal merchants. The sandstorm is too big, so we're hiding in here for the time being. He was the most composed in the group, and by the looks of it, he should be the leader. Nanfeng asked, If you're normal merchants, then why are you sneaking around and hiding? The elder was about to respond when a youth of about 17 years shouted, We weren't planning on sneaking around, but you guys suddenly rushed in. Who knows whether you're good or evil? Then we keep hearing you talk about the wicked master of Ban Yue, some ghost realm, and igniting fire in your palms. We thought you guys were the Ban Yue soldiers out patrolling and hunting for flesh. No way we'd make a sound. Stop talking, Tiansheng. The old man hushed the boy, afraid that he might offend the other party. The youth had thick brows and large eyes, the face of a tiger, but he shut up immediately the moment an elder spoke. Xianin put down his hands, his ears no longer ringing, and smiled brightly to relax the atmosphere. It's all a misunderstanding. Let's all relax and not panic. He paused before continuing to explain. We're not Ban Yue soldiers. This servant is only a cultivator from a small shrine. These are... people... from my shrine. We only know small tricks, nothing fancy. You're normal merchants, and we're normal cultivators without malicious intent. It just so happens that we all entered the same shelter to hide away from the same sandstorm. Xianin's voice was soft and gentle, each word spoken slowly to calm everyone's nerves. After much explanation and reassurance, the merchant party finally relaxed. Suddenly, Sanlong laughed. I think they're being way too humble. Those merchants aren't as simple as they say they are. 
No one understood what he meant and looked at him in confusion. Don't at least half the travelers go missing when trekking through the Benyue Pass? To cross this land when knowing this rumor, surely you're all extraordinarily brave. Nothing normal about you. That's not all true, young man, the elder responded. Some caravans have passed through without harm before. A ho? Sanlong hummed. As long as you find the right guide and go around the Benyue territory, then all is well. So this time, we sought out and found a local to lead us, the elder said. Yeah, that youth, Tiansheng, spoke up. It all depends on the guide. We owe everything to A Zhao Ge. If not for him, we wouldn't have been able to avoid all those quicksand pits. When the sandstorm started, he knew exactly where to bring us to hide. Otherwise, we would be buried alive in sand by now. Xianlian took a glance. This A Zhao, who guided them, looked rather young, seemingly in his 20s, with a clean, respectable face. When he was praised by the other two, he didn't make a show of it, only turning away glumly. It's nothing, just doing my duty. Hopefully when the wind dies down, none of the camels or shipments will have been damaged. They'll be fine for sure! The merchants were all very optimistic, but Xianlin had a feeling things weren't as simple as they all thought. If all trouble could be avoided by simply not crossing into Benyue territory, then, did all the former travelers who lost their lives die because they didn't believe in the rumors? Xianlin gave it some thought and said to Nanfeng and Fu Yao in a quiet voice, This is too sudden. Once this storm passes, we'll need to make sure these people pass safely before going to the Benyue ruins. Then, Xianlin looked back down to continue deciphering the Benyue writing on the stone slate. He recognized the word general earlier, but that was because it was a word often used. It had been 200 years since he last visited the kingdom of Benyue. Even if he was fluent then, it had all been forgotten since. To suddenly pick up the burden of translation really required time and patience. Just then, Sanlong said, Tomb of the General. Xianlin remembered now. The last character was the word for tomb, grave, burial, and other similar terms. He turned to look at him, amazed. Sanlong, do you know Benyue script too? Sanlong smiled. Not much. I only know a few words because they're interesting. Xianlian was already used to him saying that. The word tomb was not one often used. If Sanlong really only knew not much, how would he happen to know exactly just what this one character meant? His not much had come to mean ask away, and Xianlian seized the chance. Excellent! Maybe the characters you recognize happen to be the ones I don't know. Come closer and let's examine this together. Xianlin waved his hand lightly to beckon, so Sanlong went over. Nanfeng and Fu Yao stood next to them, lighting the tomb for them to read with their palm torches. Xianlin lightly touched the words with his fingers, reviewing the writing in low voices with Sanlong, softly reading the words. The more they read, the more amazed they looked, before gradually becoming more glum. The merchant boy, Tiansheng, was young after all, and youths were prone to curiosity. After the slight altercation earlier, it was as if they had become familiar, so he called out, Gaga, what does it say on the rock? Xianlin snapped out of it and replied, This stone slate is a memorial. It tells the story of the life of a general. A Benyue general? Tiansheng asked. No, a Midlands general, Sanlong answered. A Midlands general? Nanfeng was puzzled. Why would the people of Benyue build a memorial for a Midlander? I thought the two kingdoms were constantly at war with each other. This general is special, Sanlong replied. Although the memorial calls him a general, he was actually no more than a captain. But he was promoted to general later? Nope. At the beginning, he led troops of hundreds before dwindling to a troop of 70, then to 50. In other words, continued demotion. The feeling of being demoted to the point of nothing was quite familiar to Xilin, and he could feel eyes on him. He pretended not to notice, and continued to decipher the Benyue writing. Tiansheng couldn't understand and continued asking, What kind of official gets demoted lower and lower in rank? As long as he didn't make any major mistakes, there should be only delays in promotion, not demotion. How much of a failure do you have to be? Xilin rolled his right hand into a fist and raised it to his lips. He faintly cleared his throat and replied in a stern voice, <clears throat> Young man, Receiving continuous demotion is not as rare as you think. 
huh? Sun Long chuckled. It's true. It happens a lot. He paused before continuing. This captain got demoted time and time again, not because he was incapable or incompetent for duty. Despite poor relations on both sides of the conflict, instead of winning battles on the battlefield, he kept getting in the way. What do you mean, getting in the way? Nefong asked. He prevented his enemies from killing Midland civilians, and he also blocked his own army from killing the people of Banyue. Every time he did this, he got demoted a rank. Sun Long spoke lightheartedly, and the seven to eight merchants sat closer to him like it was story time. Soon, they got into it and started commenting. I don't think the captain did anything wrong, Tianzhong remarked. It shouldn't be a problem if you let soldiers kill each other, but not civilians, right? He's too blindly kind for a soldier, but overall, he didn't commit any crimes? Yeah, he's saving lives, not killing people. Xilin smiled at all the comments. The merchants before them never lived a day at a battle-torn border and were not the same people of 200 years ago. The kingdom of Benyue had long perished. It was easy for them to say this, criticize that, even compliment, but the actions of that captain weren't so easily forgiven back then, not with a simple remark of, he's just blindly kind. Within the group, only A Zhao understood better, probably because he was a local. Now is now. 200 years ago is 200 years ago. To only receive demotion was already a blessing for this captain. Fu Yao, however, clicked his tongue. <laughs> Laughable. Xianan could pretty much guess what he was about to say, and rubbed his forehead. As he expected, Fu Yao looked rather troubled under the light of the flickering flames. One must do the duty as demanded by their position. If he became a soldier, then he must always remember to defend his country and kill enemies on the front lines. Casualties are inevitable in war. Such soft-heartedness has no place in war and will only drag down his fellow soldiers. His enemies will also think him foolish. No one will thank him in the end. Fu Yao's words had irrefutable logic and silence soon filled the cave. He continued dryly, People like that only have one end, death. They will either die in battle or at the hands of their own people. After being struck speechless for a moment, Xielin broke the silence. Yeah, you're quite right. He did die. Tianzhong was shocked. Ah, how did he die? Was he really killed by his own people? Xielin chewed on his words, but still replied in the end. Not really. Here, it says that there was once a battle when both sides clashed, and as they fought, this man's bootlaces came loose, and he stepped on them, tripped, then... Everyone in the cave had thought the death would have been tragic but heroic, so they were all taken aback at first, thinking what kind of death was that? Then, laughter exploded. <laughs> Is that so funny? Sun Long arched his brows. Xianan also piped up. <clears throat> yeah, it's rather tragic. Let's be more sympathetic and not laugh, yeah? We're in his tomb, after all. Let's give him some face. I don't mean anything malicious by laughing, Tianxiang immediately claimed. But his death is just so... <laughs> there was nothing Xilin could do. Reading the epitaph to this point, even he wanted to laugh, so he didn't comment and continued to translate. In any case, even though this captain didn't have a good reputation in the army, the border citizens were all very grateful for his efforts and called him general. They built this temple stone tomb for him and erected a stone slate to remember him by. Later, the people of Banyu discovered another miraculous thing about this memorial. As long as one could hose before this stone slate three times, one can transform all disasters met in the Gobi to good fortune. Senlong completed the translation. His tone of voice was mysterious and meaningful, very convincing. His expression was also serious, so when the group heard, several of them immediately started prostrating, muttering that they'd rather believe it true than not. Xielin, however, was confused. W what? I is that written here? Is it really that magical? Sanlong smiled softly and said in a lowered voice, No, I made that up, but since they laughed earlier, their prostrating now should make up for it. Xielin looked back at the stone slate and saw that it was indeed the end of the epitaph and there were no more words. At first, he was feeling a bit woeful, but now he thought it funny and whispered back, 
Why are you so mischievous? San Long stuck out his tongue and the two chuckled. Just then, someone shrieked, What's this? The shriek echoed in the cave, sharply reverberating against the walls, causing all the hairs to stand. Xilin instantly turned around where the shriek came from and demanded, What happened? Where the merchants were once sitting, everyone had scrambled in a flash, scurrying away in fear and alarm. Snake! Nanfeng and Fu Yao moved their palms towards the commotion and lit up the ground in that direction. Curled on the sandy floor was a slender, brilliantly colored snake. Why is there a snake? The crowd was growing increasingly anxious. Why, why did the snake not make any noise when it slithered out? When the flames lit up over the snake, it instantly became alert and raised itself to a position of attack. Nanfeng was about to torch it when someone leisurely strolled over and easily snatched the snake with his left hand, clutching it at its heart. He brought it closer to observe it and said, Isn't it normal to have snakes in the desert? Someone this unscrupulous and gutsy was, of course, Sanlong. They say to fight a snake, seize it where the heart is. If pressed here hard enough, no matter how venomous its fangs, it would be helpless. The snake wrapped its long tail around Sanlong's left arm meekly. At closer range, Xianin could see clearly. The snake had translucent skin, its vivid red insides mixed with visible threads of black, resembling inner organs, rather disgusting. The tail was the color of flesh, segmented like layers of a hard shell, unlike that of a snake, more like a scorpion. Seeing this, Xianin's face changed and called out, Watch out for its tail! Before Xianin finished his sentence, the long snake body that was wrapped around Senlong's left arm suddenly let go. The tail snapped backwards and tried to stab viciously towards Senlong. Venomous as the tail was, Senlong's right hand was faster and easily caught the tail. Now holding both head and tail, Senlong showed off the snake to Xielin like it was an interesting toy, laughing. <laughs> this tail is pretty cool. On the end of the tail grew a long, flesh-red needle. Xielin sighed in relief. I'm glad you weren't pricked. Looks like this is a scorpion snake. Nanfeng and Fu Yao had come near to observe the snake too. Scorpion snake? That's right, Xianin said. It's a rare poisonous vermin found only in Banyue, scarce in numbers. I've never seen them before, but I've heard of them. Body of a snake, tail of a scorpion. Its venom is the strength of both combined, and if bitten or pricked... Xielin trailed off watching Sanlong twisting the snake, pulling and squeezing it as if it was a towel, stopping short of tying it into a bow. Xianlin was speechless for a moment. Sanlong, stop playing with the poor thing. It's dangerous. Sanlong laughed. Don't worry, Gaga, it's nothing. The scorpion snake is the symbol of the Banyue Guoshi. Gotta take this rare chance to examine it. The symbol of the Banyue Guoshi? Xianlin asked in awe. That's right, Sanlong said. Apparently, it was because the Guoshi could control these scorpion snakes that the people of Fenyue believed in her powers and worshipped her. Hearing the word control brought alarm to Xielin. When it came to controlling anything, whatever it may be, it usually came in mass numbers. Everyone, leave this cave! There may be more than one scorpion snake! Ah! A voice cried out before Xielin could finish his words. Snake! Other voices started yelling. So many snakes! Over here, too! From within the shadows, seven or eight scorpion snakes soundlessly slithered into the cave. They came so swiftly and quietly from unknown crevices, but they didn't attack, only watching, judging. Soundless in both movement and attack, not even hissing from their tongues. Nanfeng and Fu Yao released two fireballs and shot them towards the snakes, exploding flames inside the cave. Get out! Xianan yelled. No one needed to be told twice, and all ran outside. Luckily, it was still light out and the twister had long passed, the wind having died down. The group of them escaped out into the open ground and kept running. As they ran, someone spoke up. That stone memorial is too scary! How come after we could hold three times, we still ran into stuff like that? Xielin was thankful that they didn't know those last words were fabricated by Senlong. But then he heard someone else say, Yeah, it's pretty much the same effect as worshipping that scrap immortal. The more you pray, the more unlucky you become. In a place where barely any sticks could hit him, he would still get shot by an arrow. Xianlian was speechless. Suddenly, Tian Sheng yelped in alarm, Uncle Zheng! 
That elder he had been assisting had collapsed. Xie Lian darted over. What happened? Pain filled the face of old man Zheng, and he raised a shaky hand. Xie Lian grabbed a hold of his hand and frowned, his heart sinking. There was a growing, angry swelling that was spreading rapidly down his palm, and within the red and purple bruising, there were two small punctures, barely visible. A wound this tiny would not have otherwise been noticed until it was too late. Everyone, check and see if you have any wounds on your bodies, Xie Lian called out immediately. If you do, use a rope to tie them off. Xie Lian turned the hand over to examine it further and saw that the red and purple swelling was climbing up the veins of the arm. He was just about to unravel Roye when, next to him, A Zhao ripped a strip of fabric from his own clothing and promptly knotted it tightly on the old man's bicep to prevent the venom from progressing. Xie Lian was amazed at his speed. He looked up, and then Feng wordlessly took out a medicine bottle and popped out a pill for the old man to swallow. Uncle, are you okay? Tian Sheng cried. A Zhao Ge, uncle won't die, will he? A Zhao shook his head. To get bitten by the scorpion snake means certain death within four hours. Tian Sheng was shaken. Then, then what do we do? Old Man Zheng was the leader of the caravan, and the other merchants also started panicking. This, this buddy here just gave him a pill, right? That wasn't an antidote, Nan Feng said. It's for temporary longevity. The most it can give him is 24 hours. The crowd became even more distressed. Only 24 hours? Does that mean we can only sit here and wait for death to come? Is there no saving him from this venom? Right then, Sen Long walked over slowly. There is a way. Everyone turned to stare at him. Tian Sheng turned his head joyously. A Zhao Ge, if there is a way, why didn't you say so? Give me a fright. However, A Zhao was still silent and soundlessly shook his head. Of course it's not easy for him to say, Sen Long said. How could he possibly tell you that the bitten one could only be saved at the cost of everyone else's lives? Sen Long, what do you mean? Xie Lin asked. Ge Ge, do you know the story behind the scorpion snakes? Sen Long asked. In the legends, many hundreds of years ago, there was once a king of Ban Yue who, while hunting, inadvertently caught two spirits born from two venomous creatures, one snake and one scorpion. The two venoms cultivated deeply within the mountains, ignorant of the world and caused no afflictions. The king, nevertheless, considered their nature and believed they would cause evil sooner or later. He planned to execute them. They begged and begged for their lives to be spared, but the king was cruel. He forced the two creatures to mate at one of his many festivities before a drunken audience, and after the festivities, they were still executed. Only the queen was sympathetic and pitied the two creatures. In order not to go against the will of the king, she could only cover their corpses with a fern leaf. The snake and scorpion became vengeful spirits and cursed the descendants born from their mating to forever remain in the kingdom of Ban Yue to destroy its people. Since that time, the scorpion snakes are found only within Ban Yue territory. Should anyone be bitten or pricked, the venom would spread like wildfire and they would die a miserable death. However, thanks to that one act of kindness from the queen, the fern leaves used to cover its corpses became the antidote for their venom. That plant is called Shan Yue and only grows within the borders of Ban Yue, San Long finished. Is, is the legend true? Can it be believed? The merchants asked anxiously. Little buddy, this concerns life and death. Don't joke around with us. San Long smiled but said nothing, refusing to speak more after telling Xie Lian the tale. Tian Sheng turned towards A Zhao. A Zhao Ge, is what that red-clad Ge Ge said true? After humming for a moment, A Zhao replied, whether the legend is true, I do not know, but the Shan Yue plant does grow within the walls of Ban Yue, and it is indeed the antidote for the scorpion snake venom. Meaning, the only way to live after getting bitten is to venture into the kingdom of Ban Yue, Xilin said. No wonder so many caravans would pass through Ban Yue territory despite knowing the deadly rumors. It wasn't that they were defiant and stubbornly went to seek their own deaths, but rather that, if they didn't go, they would certainly die. The scorpion snake was the symbol of the wicked master of Ban Yue, and they were also controlled by her. The appearance of these snakes was no mere coincidence. With only a few heavenly officials like them here, there was no way they could ensure the absolute safety of the entire merchant group, and there was no knowing how many more snakes would show. Xie Lin raised two fingers and pressed them against his temple, 
trying to connect with the heavenly communication array to see if he could borrow more junior officials with his thick skin and have more help in protecting the people. No dice. The connection wouldn't respond. Xilin lowered his hand and wondered, I didn't use up all of my powers, did I? I calculated this morning, and there was still a small bit left. He turned to Nanfeng and Fu Yao. Can either of you try and enter the communication array? I'm blocked. After a moment, the other two also looked grim. I can't get in either, Nanfeng said. It couldn't have been the sandstorm that disrupted their connections. There had been cases where the connection would become frazzled in areas of highly evil auras, potent enough to diminish the powers of various heavenly officials. It seemed as though that was what was happening now. Xielin paced in a circle and wondered out loud. It might be because we're too close to the kingdom of Ben Yue, so the communication array was blocked. Just then, in the corner of his eye, there was a flash of red. Nanfeng and Fu Yao were busy trying to reconnect with the communication array, and everyone else was occupied checking for wounds on their body. The boy Tian Sheng was anxiously holding tightly onto old man Zheng and didn't notice a wine-red scorpion snake soundlessly climbing up his spine, curling near the neck, and opening its mouth. However, the fangs were not aiming at Tian Sheng's neck, but at Senlong's arm right next to it. The snake leaned back, then pounced. In the speed of a second, before the snake had the chance to sink its fangs into Senlong, Xianan's hand shot out and snatched the snake right at the heart with blinding precision. Given his strength, Xianan could crush the snake's heart if he wanted to, rupture its innards, and spill its insides. But not knowing whether the snake's flesh was also poisonous, he didn't dare to press harder. Xianan raised his other hand to grab for the tail, but the snake was slippery and artful, making it hard to catch. Xianan squeezed, but only felt something soft and cold slither between his fingers, and the next moment, a sharp needle pain flared from the back of his hand. Mm -hmm.